This is Twit. You know how much we love robots on this show, especially Boston Dynamics robots that have been entertaining or terrifying us in YouTube videos for years. We'd heard that parent company Alphabet was looking for a buyer for Boston Dynamics, and it appears that they found one. Joining us to talk about this story and a few other stories she's been covering this week is Ellen Hewitt from Bloomberg. Welcome to the show, Ellen. Thanks for having me. So who now owns our future ro robot overlords? So Boston Dynamics used to be owned by Alphabet slash Google. Uh, for a long time. And a year ago, I think it was even um, our own Gladstone at Bloomberg who had the scoop first, which was that Google was looking to sell Boston Dynamics. And it had been sort of a marquee part of Google's purchase of all these robotics companies. Um, and uh, they sold it to SoftBank. So that's, you know, that's who owns it now. It's really unclear who is going to be or, or really how Boston Dynamics is going to fit within SoftBank if it's going to be part of the regular company or part of its vision fund, which is a, a, you know, an enormous fund that they've been using to invest in a lot of Valley startups. Um, but I think what will remain is Boston Dynamics has always been kind of this individual place where they've made these really freaky and really powerful robots um, that really maybe don't have that much commercial um, application right now. That was a major problem for Alphabet and a reason, you know, that they wanted to sell was that it, it really didn't fit in with the rest of the business of Google, no matter how interesting it was or no matter how many YouTube views the videos that demonstrate their robots got. And that was a lot because they are really interesting to watch. <laughs> yeah, but they weren't really uh, selling them. And I guess it was also, they, they were not great for Google's image, right? Because whenever anyone saw them, they immediately thought like, oh, that robot could kill a person pretty quickly. Is that what Google's planning on doing? <laughs> it's certainly unsettling to watch them. I think they are also super interesting. Uh, and But yeah, I think the, the major problem I imagine was that the commercial application is not so obvious. And in the last couple of years, um, since Google has really reshaped itself as Alphabet and these other bets, then you've seen Google kind of pare back and, and pull back resources from some of its side bets that have been a little bit more moonshotty than others, uh, one of which being the robotics division, which has sort of been broken up. It used to be something that they'd put together um, with the hopes of having Andy Rubin, the creator of Android, run something. But he has left Google, um, left Alphabet, and, and you're seeing this slow process of Alphabet sort of selling off some of the parts of Google that we once thought of as kind of the weird, cool things that they do. Uh, they, they maybe don't have a home at Alphabet anymore. It's kind of amazing how how quickly the the march to robots literally from Google like halted the second Andy Rubin kind of walked out stepped out the door. It was almost immediately like, well, I guess maybe we should do something else. Um, one thing that I've loved about Boston Dynamics, as as we were talking about, is the fact that they're so open, they're so willing to share the work that they're doing, uh, you know, on YouTube, so people can watch it. Is there any? I don't know, any indication from what we know about SoftBank to know whether they're more likely to keep these advancements close to their chest or, or I don't know. I just don't want, I don't want these videos to go away. I want to know about these robots. <laughs> um, I think that, uh, you know, maybe that just depends on sort of how the leadership within Boston Dynamics is going to fit in with SoftBank. I know it sounds like um, SoftBank's leaders and management are really interested in what robotics can do, and they seem really enthusiastic about the future that, we could have with smart robotics, you know. Um, mm -hmm. So I imagine maybe they'd be eager to show off uh, what the company could do under their uh, corporate umbrella, but we'll have to wait and see. Yeah. Now, is SoftBank like a Google um, or is it more, is it smaller than that? It, what, what could you compare it to? I mean, it's huge. And if you, if recently the role that they've been playing in Silicon Valley has been really um, in investing in these startups, and it has this enormous um, vision fund, which has you know hundreds of billions of dollars, ugh, I think, has a lot of money, and it's been putting a lot of money into startups. And actually, what's been interesting is seeing the ripple effect that that's been having. Is in fact, you know, sometimes when the vision fund comes in and says, you know, SoftBank wants to put X number of dollars in your startup, and the startup actually says, actually, you know, we want less, or you know, we don't want to sell as much of the company. Um, there's so much money in this fund that they've been really putting in that money, kind of sometimes over the protests of the companies themselves, and it's been rising valuations for a lot of startups. It's sort of an interesting dynamic within the startup scene where, where this company has so much money to invest um, in, in other companies that's been changing the regular dynamics of venture investing. 
So let's move on to another story that you reported this week. It's not new that many tech executives first meet each other at Harvard, where they go not just for the education, but for the connections. But sometimes those connections can get complicated when one of those connections ends up marrying the president's daughter. Tell us about this story that you reported this week. Right. So the story is about Cadre, which is a startup that runs a platform that lets accredited investors invest in commercial real estate. So this is usually an asset class that you can only have access to if you are paying into a real estate fund or something like that. But with this platform, you could maybe buy a very small slice of an apartment building or retail building. Um, you know, real estate tends to have high risk, but high yield. So it's an asset class a lot of people want to get into. Um, that's kind of the, the straightforward pitch. The complicating factor is that the CEO, Ryan Williams, is um, a guy who went to Harvard two years behind Josh Kushner, um, met Josh at Harvard, became close through Josh with his brother, Jared Kushner. Um, and the three of them actually co-founded the company, although Ryan is the CEO and he's the one who kind of does most of the day-to-day -day business. But he said in an interview with us this week that, you know, he considers both brothers to be co-founders. Um, Josh is really involved because Thrive Capital, which is a, a, you know, the firm where Josh is a partner, uh, is an investor and Josh is on the board. Um, Jared is also you know, considered a co-founder, but is less involved now. He had a board seat, but stepped down. He had a stake. He sold some of it. And it, that's where it gets touchy because Jared Kushner, you know, was reported about a month ago that Jared Kushner still has a stake in Cadre, but did not disclose it in sort of the standard way when he was um, disclosing all of the stakes that he held. And this is important because he's a senior advisor to Trump. People are supposed to know where um, his ties are business-wise. Um, and so this kind of put a bit of scrutiny on Cadre. People were asking themselves, you know, what is this company? And it also had recently raised a, a fairly large round. So, you know, we reported it was $65 million led by Andreessen Horowitz at a valuation of more than $800 million. So, so like a, a fairly high-profile startup, but then with this additional complication of like, you know, how, you know, is Jared still involved? How is Josh involved? Is this um, any sort of conflict of interest? Like people have definitely been paying attention to what this uh, connection is and really what the details of it are. I got the sense from reading your article that they were sort of trying to distance themselves now uh, from the Kushners. Yeah, I would say that's definitely true. I mean, it's it's complicated. It's a complicated dance for Cadre because as the CEO told me, Jared and Josh's connections when they first started the company were essential to helping it get the right networks, get the right investors. Um, you know, they, you know, there's no one more connected in real estate than than the Kushners. So to have two of them as a co-founder is a huge boon. However, things get complicated when when Trump became president. So then, you know, I think you could look at the company's press release about their funding round, and they did not mention the Kushners at all. So this is this was, um, I think, they're trying to make it clear that the company stands separately from the brothers. However, you know, the CEO told me Josh is super involved. He, they talk on the phone once or twice a week. He's still on the board. He still has a stake through Thrive Capital. He's like calling him up and giving him product advice and stuff. So it's kind of hard. I think they want to have both, you know, this strong connection that really helps the business, not drawing too much attention to uh, the complications of being connected to uh, the president. Well, I know Joshua Kushner came out and said, you know, right after Trump was elected, like, I am not involved and really tried to separate himself and Thrive Capital. But it's complicated. I mean, part of one of the um, in, uh, Thrive Capital is a big investor in like a healthcare startup that was designed to help people navigate uh, how to get healthcare, which is, of course, now in the hands of Trump and Kushner. And it seems like it would be impossible not to have a conflict of interest, even if he's staying up and saying, I'm not involved. Yeah, I think the conflict of interests can be found in a lot of different companies. And yes, anything that has to do with healthcare is going to be extra sensitive. You know, there's regulations in a lot of industries. And I think um, basically, you know, and with the case of Cadre, it was really helpful to have the Kushners involved basically until more recently in which it became very complicated. So I think there there may be other Kushner connected businesses and, and they are connected in a lot of ways to a lot of different businesses and industries that may feel like ah, actually things are kind of complex now that um, Donald Trump is president. Well, you cover startups for Bloomberg, and uh, you reported this week on funding for Pinterest, which I don't think of as a startup, but it seems to be raising money like one. Can you tell us about this news? Yeah, so we had a scoop today, um, not today, a few days ago, that Pinterest was raising $150 million. 
Uh, and it's been more than two years since they last raised. The sh preferred share price is the same. So in, in our eyes, that was what you might call a flat round. Um, Pinterest actually disputed this in a particular way where they said, well, you know, because we've issued more shares, the total valuation of the company is higher. I kind of think that that's, personally, I think it's a little misleading. People tend to think of an up round as the actual share price increasing in value over time. But anyway, yes, Pinterest still a startup, still raising money. I think this you know, the significance of this is, you know, Pinterest has talked a lot about and there's been expectations that they would go public sometime. To me and to people who follow Pinterest closely, I think the idea that they would continue to raise money suggests they're not quite ready or that they don't have the business model um, at a mature level where they can be making the kind of money where they don't need to be raising outside capital. So to us, it was kind of a significant story in that in that Pinterest was both raising money at all and then secondly, that they were um, continuing to do it at kind of the same level that they'd been doing a couple of years ago. You know, they have been trying to expand, um, you know, some of their advertising opportunities. And people tend to think Pinterest has a good place for this because people go there with the intent to buy and look for products. And, you know, uh, that's a good place to be advertising. But it seems like this signals maybe things are not working out the way that they thought they would be. Yeah, that's that's kind of my question with Pinterest is that, it, I mean, it's been around so long and it, like it's just kind of a... a a staple in the social media world. It's definitely, you know, a social media network that a lot of people have used, but so many of the other networks seem to be propelling so much, you know, skyrocketing quicker, faster than Pinterest is. That's just kind of going slow and steady. Is it a quality of ad network sort of thing? I know some of, you know, I've, I've read a lot of feedback from people who just say the, the quality of the ads aren't that good uh, on the network. Yeah. And, yeah. I mean, I think what they're trying to do and, and the way that they're trying to improve this is by improving their visual search. They have some pretty powerful right. um, technology that allows you to take photos of items and then search for similar items or images on Pinterest. Whether that's going to pan out into better advertising revenue, I don't know. You're totally right. There are other, um, you know, Instagram is a great sort of example of a competitor where I think growth has really continued at a stronger pace than it has at Pinterest. They have more monthly active users, um, you know, and I think that just means more eyes against which you can sell advertising. And so it's unclear to me whether the technological advances that Pinterest is trying to incorporate uh, are going to help it be more, uh, you know, get more revenue from ads um, as compared to some of its other competitors. Yeah. Yeah, it makes you wonder if Instagram had stayed independent, not been bought by Facebook, if they would have tried to have done this now. And it, because right, right yeah. now <laughs> it is totally seamless to buy something that you see on Instagram versus Pinterest. I always feel like I'm, you know, I'm I'm stuck in this. You know, I'm never taken to where I want to go immediately. Yeah, you're. <laughs> that's my that's my, one of my complaints with Pinterest. It's like, oh yeah, I want to go to that thing, and I click it, and it didn't actually take me to the thing I wanted to go to. It took me to a great a, a whole new list of things mm -hmm. that look like it. And I'm like, I never know what I'm doing here. What am I doing here? Other than like shaming myself for the fact that I can't quite make that look as good as you made that look. Yeah, exactly. Pinterest There's is There's a really lot of good. Pinterest shame. Yeah, we deal with it very all the time. Yeah. <laughs> well, Ellen, thank you so much for joining us. Ellen Hewitt <laughs> is a reporter at Bloomberg. Uh, where, where's the best place to follow you online? You can find me on Twitter at Ellen Hewitt, last name H-U-E-T. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ellen. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Take care. Have a great night.